Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, uh, depending upon your time zone. Welcome to the June 2024 Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Uh, we have a, a great agenda for today, but before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special in Industry Group and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support. And let's go on to the next slide. Go. Um, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy that's being showed and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect. We never discriminate. We communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. Everyone's welcome to our meetings, and this is an open forum for sharing ideas and having constructive discussions. These are the Hyperledger premier members. We always like to say thank you to them at the beginning uh, of our presentations. If you haven't been involved in open source before, this is an open forum, as I said. If this is your first time, feel free to lurk. Uh, I lurk on quite a few of these Hyperledger meetings, um, but it's always great to listen in. If there is something that you would like to say uh, or mention, or if this is your first time, just please introduce yourself in the comments. Here's our agenda for today. We've already covered the introduction. And next, we'll go over some Hyperledger community information. James will then give us an update on blockchain in the mortgage industry. Then Gabriel Sadoon and Martin Hotka from DigiShares will walk us through their tokenization solution. We always cover this slide in each meeting. This is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey, but we just may be at different points along that path. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey and to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases and define potential implementation paths for the mortgage industry. What does a mortgage company need to implement blockchain and how difficult is it to implement blockchain? The next several slides I always mention, but I go through pretty quickly. Um, for those that are new to the group, uh, this is just a, a list of the different sites, the Linux Foundation, the Hyperledger Foundation. The second from the bottom is our group wiki. That's our central knowledge base. Uh, James will cover this in more detail in one of his slides, but we invite you to take a look at and, and use this information. To access this information, you will need an LFID. This slide shows you how to do it. Very quick video. I won't spend a, a lot of time on this. Then you can also get a Hyperledger Fabric certification. And uh, I always mention blockchain training. This is how I got knowledgeable about Hyperledger and different blockchain technologies. It, it's very, uh, It's very good training, very insightful, and it's free. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to James, and he's going to go over the status of blockchain in the mortgage industry. Excellent, Marvin. Thank you very much for that introduction, and welcome, everybody, to our monthly presentation. Um, you know, focusing on tokenization this month, we were doing research, and we actually curated, it was a great month for tokenization, we curated over a dozen articles that we added to our library, and I want to touch on just a few of those in our conversations today. Um, Marvin, let's go ahead and move into the first slide. Fantastic. So our first article from Coin Codex presents several examples of how tokenization is being implemented. It opens discussions with how tokenization can help to incentivize individuals who want to support local communities through housing projects by using funds for construction or renovation of existing properties for affordable housing owned by the local communities. People can acquire tokens to support these projects and also have a say in how they are implemented, contributing to the overall impact that they have. 
Because tokenized real estate assets generate passive income while increasing in value, returns can provide an ongoing source of funding for further projects. So as an example of this, in Australia, the digital asset form Digital X has created the Housing Asset Reference Token, or HART Fund, which provides investors exposure to real estate investments in tokenized form. The fund is at the forefront of efforts to solve Australia's housing department affordability crisis with a concept based on co-ownership. Residents own the majority of the properties within its portfolio, with the remainder owned by the fund, which is financed by the sale of tokenized fractions of its share of the home. So, you know, a great article and interesting to see what they're developing in Australia. Our second article, actually back up a slide if you would, Marvin. Thank you. All right. Our, <laughs> our next article, it's a fairly extensive article. It was written by Emily George and published on LinkedIn. So she covers everything in this article from smart contracts, tokenization, blockchain security, and transact speed among just a few of the topics. But sticking with this month's topic in the tokenization space, Emily provides an overview for what tokenization is and how real estate can be converted into digital assets. These digital assets open up real estate investments to a larger audience. Instead of needing hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest, individuals can start with just a few hundred dollars. By breaking down properties into smaller, more affordable tokens, blockchain democratizes real estate investment. And because tokens can be traded on digital exchanges, buying and selling property shares becomes as easy as trading stocks. So in Colorado, St. Regis Aspen Resort, they actually raised $18 million through a tokenized security offering. Investors buy digital shares of the resort, giving them a stake in the property's uh, future profits. Other use cases described include property management, land registries, construction development, and even the launching of a real estate tokenization platform. So again, a really great article coming out of LinkedIn. Uh, moving over to the next slide, Marvin. All right, from our neighbors to the north in Toronto, Fractic has announced the successful completion of a pilot marking a significant step towards making real estate investment accessible for investors worldwide. So Fractic offers fractional real estate ownership through fractable tokens is what they call them which are fully backed by real world assets. By bringing real estate on chain, Fractic provides holders with both real estate and DeFi benefits. The pilot involved the tokenization of a high-end condo valued at 235,000 US. It was successfully tokenized into 235 Fractable tokens, each priced at 1,000 US. These tokens were sold to a private group of investors, ensuring compliance with all relevant regulations. And fractable holders benefit from stable returns through rental yields and long-term capital appreciation. So each fractable token represents fractional ownership of the property, providing a tangible stake in real estate with the added liquidity and ease of blockchain technology. With a successful pilot, Fracted is poised to expand its footprint, aiming to democratize real estate investments for a global audience. And the last article I wanted to introduce today is BlockSquare. So a BC-based tokenization platform, BlockSquare, tokenized $100 million worth of real estate properties, coinciding with the launch of its new DeFi launchpad, OceanPoint. So based out of Slovenia, BlockSquare offers SaaS solutions for blockchain-based real estate tokenization to connect investors to real estate properties globally. So far, the protocol has tokenized 118 assets, including hotels, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and apartments across more than 21 countries. BlockSquare's utility token, BST, powers the OceanPoint DeFi ecosystem, where users can stake BST and convert it to the governance token, SBST. This setup allows community members to support tokenization marketplace operators and earn rewards. 
Meanwhile, Marketplace Pools platform provides both marketplace operators and community members a place to engage within the ecosystem. So as an additional note, BlockSquare previously had made history by completing the world's first notarized tokenization of a real estate property in September of last year. Uh, Marvin, let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so that's just an example of some of the tokenization articles we uh, curated for the month of June. All of those articles and our previous articles can all be accessed via the Mortgage Industry subgroup wiki, which you see on the screen right now. In fact, uh, in the upper right-hand corner is the information that Marvin talked about on how to set up your free LFID account. By setting that up, you're going to get notifications for future meetings. You're going to get notifications monthly as we're updating the wiki here. Also on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see in that menu, you've got all of our previous presentations going back to 2021. So if you want to take a look at the recording or the presentation or any of the previous articles that were used, those are accessible over there. Um, Alma just dropped into the chat for us a link. So if you get an opportunity, click on that link and make it a favorite. And Marvin, I'm going to pass it over to you for introduction of our guest speakers. Thanks, James. Uh, always some interesting information. As the articles James has discussed, tokenization continues to be a key area of interest for the financial services industry, in, including the mortgage industry. I had the pleasure of meeting one of our next speakers at the Token Expo in San Francisco several weeks ago, where he spoke about tokenization in real estate. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gabriel Sadoon. Head of Business Development, and I, I think Martin Hartka, uh, Head of Blockchain Development from DigiShares, uh, will be joining us as well. Gabriel has an investment banking background and was previously with Galileo Global Securities in New York City. So, Gabriel, take it away. Thank you so much, Marvin. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, indeed, um, Martin is going to join uh, the, the call in the next few minutes. Uh, he'll be mainly focusing on giving you guys a, a demo of um, our something called real estate that exchange that I'll, I'll, I'll speak about um, just in a bit. Um, and I'll be just giving the main presentation on uh, tokenization, what we do at DigiShares. I'll be talking a little bit about uh, liquidity and, and, and why it's important and how tokenization can uh, help solve the problem. And then Introduce real estate dot exchange, uh, which is one of our new projects, and then yeah, Martin will be uh, giving the demo. So that's for the uh, the agenda on our side. Uh, I am going to share my screen. Ah, okay, okay. I'm going to try again. Here we go. All right, you should be able to see my screen. Yep. Yeah, so briefly, uh, before I start presenting, uh, DigiShares uh, was founded in 2018 in Denmark um, by Klaus Koning, who's a PhD in computer science, a serial entrepreneur. Um, and uh, he and th the co-founders at the time wanted to offer a way to invest, um, uh, an easy way to invest in local Danish startups, uh, you know, in fractional amounts to um, anyone who wanted to. And he realized that there wasn't any white label infrastructure to do that and so that he'd have to build everything uh, uh, within his company and 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 so um, the company then then moved into um, providing a white label solution for many different industries and um, real estate being the largest industry in the world um, in terms of assets uh, asset valuation um, became the the the, the, the main industry um, that we serve just because most of our clients, um, uh, were wanted to tokenize real estate. Um, and so, yeah, 2020, we onboarded our first client. Uh, we've been live since, um, on all continents. Um, there are about 15 of us, uh, today, um, within DigiShares. Um, a lot of the team is in Denmark. Uh, others are in um, other parts of Eastern Europe, like like Martin, who will join in a bit. Uh, I'm in Miami, Florida, and uh, basically we provide a um, a white label tokenization platform, which gives the tools to companies 
uh, to create security tokens, onboard investors, manage them, and then provide the tools for, for trading of those tokens between uh, investors. So, so that's just a little bit about um, us. Maybe one last thing. We, so we, we work a lot with uh, real estate developers, uh, real estate crowdfunding platforms, uh, but also um, regulated capital market firms, um, uh, companies in the hospitality space, the precious metal space, the whiskey space. So there are all sorts of uh, real world assets being being tokenized today. Um, so I'll start Gabriel, this. Gabriel, did you yeah. just say whiskey? Yes, yes. Uh, it was actually one of our first clients. Um, there, uh, the the uh, a whiskey uh, distillery in the Faroe Isles, um, uh -huh. which are uh, between uh, Norway, uh, Scotland, and Iceland in the North Sea. And um, so they claim to have like the perfect climate for, for whiskey. And so they jump started a um, the, the financing uh, and the crowdfunding of, of their of their company uh, through a security token offering. And the tokens gave the right for people to to get bottles from the first batch. Um, so it was just a great example of, of what can be done. Um, you know, if you told me we'd be talking about whiskey in our blockchain yeah. presentation <laughs> this morning, I never would have believed you. I, I'm glad you said distillery because I was picturing a bottle of whiskey that I could have a, a share in. <laughs> well, I mean, that that is definitely possible, too. I mean, I, I, I read something about the return on investment on investing in whiskey bottles. Like yeah. we're talking about like, you know, double digit returns over multiple decades like this is it's a real uh it's a real industry and a real investment uh, asset class so uh yeah that's, that's real interesting we're gonna have to look at that maybe yeah. do some sampling but <laughs> <laughs> for sure now th the fact that the whiskey is tokenized doesn't make it better than other whiskey but uh you know, okay <laughs> uh, hopefully hopefully it's they, they have good whiskey so um so yeah so just a brief um uh, overview with some definitions so we all agree on like what we're talking about um uh, tokenization you're representing ownership in a real asset on the blockchain um that happens through an spv uh most of the time if you want to fractionalize it and onboard investors it has to be an spv and you, what you're tokenizing are the shares in the spv um but you could also think of uh, other forms of tokenization where uh, like in real estate, for example, in the future, you could have the uh, the title uh, be minted as a token directly on chain by the local government. Um, so we evolve in the world of securities. So when when I'll be talking about tokenization in the next slides, it'll mostly be geared towards the securities uh, world. Um, smart contracts, um, it's Basically, instead of having a Word document with a bunch of clauses that say, if this happens, then this happens, you put all that into code and the code lives on the blockchain. Um, and so in the world of securities, you can bring a lot of automations through the, that way. So like uh, there are always uh, regulatory lockup periods, like in the US, it's a year. Um, uh, so you can code that in and make sure that nobody can resell a token within the first year. Um, you, of course, always need to have uh, KYC being done so you can code in the fact that um, a wallet that uh, did not go through uh, KYC and is associated with the identity of a person uh, cannot purchase the tokens. Um, you can make sure that you can set investor minimums and maximums, depending on the local regulations. All, all of these things can be coded in thanks to smart contracts. Um, and um, atomic swaps um are um a, a a swap contract on chain that cannot be executed um unless both parties uh authorize it and and are, are, are verified so you 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 have a wallet with the security tokens on one side the other uh wallet with USDC on the other they agree on terms you'll lock the wallets in and then the transaction can only happen if both legs of the transaction are verified you can't have it can't just happen on one side and not on the other so that uh, eliminates the need for a lot of intermediaries and, and things like that so 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 how how do these three concepts tie together um uh 
Security tokens, they exist on a blockchain and they're governed by smart contracts. And as I said, with the, the wallets, you can enter into um, uh, the an atomic uh, swap smart contract. And so you're going from a system um, where today in private markets and in, even in public markets that you have many different ledgers. Every company has their own cap table, uh, especially in the private markets on, on their, on a, like a private ledger that's siloed, um, that is impossible to interact with. Um, and you're moving from that system to a system where everybody agrees on, uh, one common decentralized, open, secure ledger. Um, and, uh, all of a sudden you're enabling direct uh, communication uh, and interaction between investors, issuers, and, and many different parties. Um, and so that enables a lot of automations. I, I mentioned a few that, that are in the world of securities. Um, and so you can massively reduce cost and like fractionalize at will and democratize that way. Um, so that's, tokenization in, in a nutshell, um, if I can, I'm getting, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, now just a, a brief overview on DigiShares. Um, so our platform focuses on, on three main things. The first is the issuance side. So you can um, create, um, you, you can create the security tokens um, and um, you can onboard in investors. Um, now it can be in the, context of a capital raise or not you can take an existing asset and just onboard existing investors and give them tokens. Um, the, we have the flows that make sure that you can KYC people, electronic signature, people can pay with uh, crypto or fiat, um, and, and you can customize the, 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 the whole process. Uh, then the second leg is uh, once investors are in, uh, you can manage those investors. So cap table management, um, send out distributions, uh, meetings, votes. Um, you can burn and reissue tokens because in uh, securities laws, uh, make sure that um, shares uh, aren't like Bitcoin, for example, where if uh, I steal uh, from someone's wallet um, and I take their Bitcoin, then uh, it's th that person is never going to see that Bitcoin again. Uh, whereas in securities, uh, that can't happen with shares under the regulation. So if I'm trying to steal uh, someone's uh, shares, well, um, that, then, then the issuer can burn the shares and reissue them to, to, the, to the right person. Um, so, so you have all those functions you can control from the platform. Um, and then uh, on the trading side of things, uh, we have a uh, bulletin board functionality uh, where investors can place buy and sell limit orders. Um, um, and 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 trade peer to peer, and and we have in the U.S. we have integration with um, a regulated ATS. I'll talk a bit about that uh, later. So that all of this is 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 compliant, um, and um, we also have a new project called Real Estate Exchange, which will be a separate brand. It will be an open um, trading venue, and I'll talk about that a bit after. Okay. Um, the security token offering process. Um, so three pillars um, on the business side, whether you're tokenizing it or not, it has to happen. Um, so you're going to select um, project. Um, you're going to decide if, if for, for, for real estate, for example, if um, the token is going to represent just one asset or a portfolio of assets. Um, and you're going to decide if you want to provide a secondary trading venue uh, for for these tokens. Um, uh, and um, if you're raising capital, um, you want to make sure you have your whole strategy in place with a business plan. You know, knowing who you're going to target um, and 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 implement a, a good uh, investor acquisition uh, strategy. Uh, so so that I mean, not much changes. Um, compared to traditional securities. Um, on the legal side as well, it's pretty much uh, the, the, the same, except that you need to create a, a special purpose vehicle 
in a jurisdiction that enables you to tokenize the shares of entities. So in the US, we're very lucky to have uh, pioneering states like Wyoming um, and Delaware that very early on also enabled this. Um, so you can create an LLC, an LP in Wyoming uh, that can own a building uh, in California um, and then investors can, can come in through there. Um, if you're raising capital, you wanna make sure you uh, go under one of the SEC exemptions. Typically it's Reg D 506 C. That's just how most capital is raised in the US. So you raise from accredited investors. You can also have Reg S uh, uh, to raise from non-US investors. And then there are a couple of other exemptions for to raise from US retail investors, although there are more limitations and complications with as soon as you wanna raise directly from retail investors. Um, so the process, the legal process, pretty much the same as for non-tokenized assets, except for the creation of the entity and adding some language around the, 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 the tokenization part. Um, then the technical side, that's where a, a company like ours uh, comes in. Um, and, and, and you can imagine us as uh, like a Shopify uh, equivalent, but for uh, the, the, the tokenized security space in the sense that we deliver the platform to you, to an issuer, and then you can um, just operate it independently. And so uh, you, would, um, you would onboard with a, a tokenization provider, uh, you would create uh, third-party accounts to make sure that you have a KYC. And um, if you want a custodial solution, you can implement that. Although self-custodial wallets work perfectly fine. Um, you want to have like a, a DocuSign functionality and, and payment processing. Um, then you can customize. Um, you can select a blockchain. Uh, hopefully people select Hyperledger. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there are others, of course, um, and you can uh, then create your your tokens, set up the wallets, and and and, and start training and testing. So so that's the that's the STO process. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about illiquidity because um, why are we doing all this? A lot of it is to solve this problem. I think. From no matter who you ask in private markets, this is a massive, massive issue. Um, and so one day I wanted to see if anyone thought of uh, or tried to figure out how much this was costing sellers in private markets. How much are sellers in private markets leaving on the table um, because there is no infrastructure for liquidity? Uh, so it turns out there have been studies. There's a great uh, meta study by um, Willamette Management Associates uh, from 2022. Um, and they look at two kinds of studies. There's the restricted stock studies, which look at um, the difference in valuation between stock of the same company that's traded on a national exchange and not traded. Sometimes the same company will have shares that are traded and not traded because uh, sometimes they want to do uh, securities offerings um, and and only target qualified, very large institutional purchasers. And so they can avoid them uh, having to register these securities with the SEC and go through a long and painful process. So they'll just have those shares um, uh, that, you know, that are restricted basically. Um, and what the various um, studies uh, find, if you look at post-1990, um, is about a 20% um, difference um, between liquid and illiquid shares. So um, what's called the illiquidity discount, and it's 20% of net asset value. Um, and then the other type of study is uh, pre-IPO uh, study. So you're looking at the same company, um, let's say zero to three months before the IPO, uh, how much are the shares worth? And then like at the moment, right after the IPO, how much, uh, how much are they worth? Um, the only difference between the two being that one is liquid, the other liquid. And what you find for that period of zero to three months before the moment of IPO is also um, 
a 20% uh, discount to net asset value. So, so this is trillions of, of, of dollars that are being left on the table um, but by sellers in private markets. Um, and um, yeah, if, so, so that's yeah, one, of the, one of the main problems. Uh, so if I go to the next, um, and of course, blockchain, uh, we think is, is the solution. Uh, otherwise we, we wouldn't be here. Um, I won't go into the, the benefits of the blockchain. I think, um, everybody, um, is, is familiar with, uh, with, with them, but so what the block, what blockchain infrastructure enables, um, is, uh, to create a system where you can uh, finally leverage some of the uh, the regulations that are already put in place uh, by the SEC, and also enables you to change the classification uh, of assets uh, uh, under the accounting rules. And so I'll go into a little bit of detail on that. So um, let's start with the on the accounting side. Um, you have something called IFRS 13. It's the global standards for asset valuation. You have three levels um, that are described in IFRS 13. Level one would be stock in Apple. For example, there's a deep liquid market. Uh, the price is clear for everyone. Level three would be real estate today. There's no secondary market. So you have to create a model, an Excel model with assumptions and um, to have a chance to you know, come to a valuation. Um, and between is level two. Uh, so there is either a limited market for the asset or there's a deep market for a similar asset. And so the problem with level three is that institutional investors today have to put aside a lot of cash um, and go through uh, massive audits um, to, uh, to, to, to stay compliant under under these um, uh, th these guidelines. Um, so it's costing them a lot, and it means that they can't allocate as much as they would like uh, to asset classes that are level three. Well, with this infrastructure, you can push asset classes like real estate uh, or private companies um, up to level two, and all of a sudden increase the allocation by a lot of institutional investors to these asset classes. Uh, then the second thing is rule uh, that I wanted to mention, rule 144 um, of the SEC, which says basically um, uh, after a one-year lockup period, an accredited or non-U.S. investor can sell to a U.S. retail investor. Um, so that's a, sort of a pathway to democratization. Uh, but without this blockchain infrastructure, it's impossible uh, for, uh, let's say, a large uh, accredited or institutional investor to like crowdfund a secondary sale to small investors. Like nobody does that uh, because there's no infrastructure. But with with the infrastructure, we think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, it'll kind of be like the the stock market uh, after after an IPO. Um, so what what you're doing is you're keeping the securities private, which enables you to live as the issuer enables you to limit costs. You don't have to go public, which, co which costs millions of dollars, but you can also get the benefit of, of liquidity uh, through this infrastructure. Um, and yeah, we th and th there's a lot of appetite for um, real world assets like, like real estate. REITs were a first uh, fantastic development um, in, in trying to make real world assets more liquid. Um, the problem with REITs is that they're generally these large opaque funds uh, where you can't really pinpoint which asset you want to invest in. Um, and they're, they're, it's expensive to set up a REIT and you also have obligations of like distributing 90% of profits. Um, so we think tokenization is going to take that uh, to, 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 to a whole new level. And you'll still have REITs, but there'll, there'll be a lot more um, you can do with tokenization. Um, and then, of course, there's appetite for this infrastructure. We're just seeing wallet adoption increase uh, quite a lot. Um, and the intersection of both is tokenized securities. So we at DigiShares, um, you, um, uh, there was a, um, the, the, the Aspen coin that was mentioned uh, previously, uh, which is the, um, by James, which is the, the resort in Colorado that's tokenized. 
Um, it's on a venue called T0. We're close partners with T0. Um, and actually the second real estate asset to ever be listed on T0 uh, was uh, one of our clients um, uh, assets in Dallas. Uh, uh, and um, so we're, um, th there are some venues that, you know, um, possibly uh, a great option for very large projects, uh, but, but the current options, they, they have significant fees. Um, and so we wanted to create an exchange that was, um, that would enable the decrease, strong, significant decrease in, in fees and just have a, 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 an easier user, user experience and um, onboarding experience for, for, for the issuer. Um, so we, we decided to create realestate.exchange. And actually, just an hour ago, we got the news that um, in the EU, we've been accepted in the official uh, sandbox uh, for, for this project. Um, we were one of our team members was in Brussels. And so this is uh, great news for us. And in the US, we have a partnership in place already with an ATS called Texture Capital. Um, and uh, so we're looking to go live in Q3, actually, in the US. Um, and so we we want to provide this infrastructure so that a lot more asset real estate assets can be tokenized and trading on a regulated venue and not just um, you know the St. Regis Aspen Resort in uh, in Colorado. Um, so um, briefly before um, before Martin uh, goes into the the demo, uh, I just wanted to talk about the the structure. Of, of something like real estate dot exchange and and how the how compliance um, is is um, uh, assured. So, if you're an issuer of um, in the real estate space, you have a multifamily building, you have your SPV, um, you're going to onboard investors uh, through a tokenization platform. Um, they're going to go through KYC. So that's the first big element. Um, only whitelisted wallets can purchase these security tokens. Um, then these investors, if they want to sell, they will go to a regulated exchange, which has, which is either in itself an ATS, so an alternative trading system, or um, has a, an integration with an ATS. And so this is an SEC license that enables a broker dealer to operate a uh, trading venue for securities. Um, and uh, so that's the second uh, key element. And um, the third key element is you want to make sure that the cap table is always in sync with uh, the venue so you can track um, what investors are doing. And um, uh, if an investor loses their access to their wallet or something happens, you can burn and reissue. So, so there are a few elements you want to put in place to make all this uh, compliant. Um, but uh, yeah, in the end, this is a venue where uh, an existing investor can place a sell limit order. A new, uh, a new investor, like a small retail investor like myself, can come in and purchase even a fractional amount of that. Um, we both lock our wallets into an atomic swap smart contract and then all of a sudden i become uh, a, um, a small co-limited partner within uh, this uh, this real estate development project um so so that's uh yeah that's what we're trying to do um and now i will let uh, martin present uh gabriel yeah. in, in this example a, a couple of questions um, okay so a if I were the developer, would you guys be tokenizing the property that I develop, or would you be tokenizing the uh, rent payments that I would be getting from the development, or would it be both? Or so, it just depends. So it, you wouldn't be tokenizing the title itself because yep. the local governments, the counties or not on on chain yet uh, hopefully yep. they, they will be uh, we're actually uh, our ceo is speaking with um uh, a local government in the middle east that's very interested in exploring this so maybe we will be able to do that soon but so what's being tokenized are shares in in an entity um now you can definitely have um, instead of just 
common equity, you can have um, a, a revenue share um, type of token where it's just the rent that's coming in um, that will um, that will be distributed to to investors. Um, but it could also be you know not only the the rents, but also like if there's a sale and the investor has equity, then they would also get proceeds from that. So you can have yeah equity, debt, um, mezzanine, um, any any type of securities that could exist today, um, and even you know like more easily facilitate revenue or profit sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Martin, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Martin Hoďka, a blockchain developer at DigiShares, and I'll be presenting a sneak peek of the real estate of the exchange platform, which is still in uh, active development. So uh, first I will just share the screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. So uh, first of all, when the investor comes into real estate of exchange, uh, they're welcomed by this UI uh, sign-in page where they can basically choose which kind of wallet they want to use. There's over 400 plus wallets which they can choose from. So no investor should be limited in this scenario. Uh, most of these wallets can be also offline as Trezor and so on. Then there's also the wallet connect option, which uh, when you have a wallet on your smartphone, you can just simply scan this QR code and you are logged in or slash registered into the platform. So uh, in this case, we'll be choosing MetaMask, which will be an injected provider into the browser itself. And here I will log in with my investor. Uh, once I'm logged in, I can here see my connected account and I can either switch networks. I can see my uh, past activity of balances moving from the platform or from the wallet into the wallet. And lastly, there is also a on-ramp solution with uh, Coinbase where let's say the investor wants to buy more stable coins for trading. They can simply just log in with Coinbase and on-ramp for example, USDC or DAI or other stable coins or currencies uh, they would like into the wallet itself. And basically once we are uh, logged in, I will just skip a bit ahead. Yes, now uh, we are in the platform. And the first thing I wanna show is this unverified badge because obviously uh, when connecting your wallet, you afterwards need to uh, go through a KYC process, right? Uh, it can be either KYC providers like SAMSAP, but we are also working on a decentralized identifier solution or DIDs uh, with Polygon ID, where essentially you have a verifiable credential. And let's say you join a different platform, which is uh, selling, let's say tokenized shares or other assets and you get your KYC and your verifiable credential on that platform. With that KYC, you can then, let's say, come to real estate exchange and use this verifiable credential. And then you just log in and you are automatically verified. Uh, we are also working on a standard called, called DITO, which is a decentralized ID for tokenization. We are collaborating with Polygon ID on that. And yeah, it will also have a verifiable credential, which uh, follows the W3C uh, schema. So it's uh, standardized, essentially. Now, once the KYC is done, uh, we can select uh, which tokens we want to trade for, for what. In this case, uh, there will be USDC as a stable coin. And uh, on the Ethereum side, you can imagine Ethereum as, let's say, a real estate uh, tokenized asset, right? So here, once I choose what I want to pay and uh, how much, in this scenario, I'm actually selling the token. So let's say I'm selling 200 of it for 12 and I place an order. Now, once the order itself is placed, 
as Gabriel was mentioning, we are working with an ATS called Texture Capital, so, uh, which uh, fulfills the role of uh, market making, meaning that uh, once an order is placed, their SEC compliant market, make, market making engine auction uh, will basically give the best prices to the investors themselves. And basically once the order itself is accepted by Texture Capital, then uh, the settlement is actually happening on chain in a peer-to-peer -peer way on the platform itself. Uh, then next to here we can see the graphs of the performance and I can just skip through that a bit and yeah we can see the live orders uh, which need to be either still executed and are waiting for confirmation from the ATS or we can also see the past orders which either have been settled or cancelled depending on the situation of the trade. Uh, Martin, a, a couple of questions. So are we looking at your wallet or are we looking at real estate exchange, the exchange itself? Or are uh, we kind of looking at both uh, your wallet and, and how the transactions you've executed on real estate exchange? Yeah, uh, it's it's essentially both, right? Because right okay. now we are log we are logged in into real estate uh -huh. exchange okay. with uh, my wallet account. So that means that I see the history of my wallet account of uh, orders which I executed right now or I which I executed in the past, right? So you can think of it in a way that with your wallet, it's like registering or signing in, right? It's basically your account with which you get in and also log out. So that's basically your entry point, the a EVM compatible wallet. Okay. So then if uh, you uh, had purchased a token, uh, a tokenized real estate or a real world asset, it would show up on the upper left-hand side under you received where you have the 12, that, that's where those assets would show up? Uh, sorry? Well, so, um, so Marvin, I think, uh, I think I can answer that one. The, um, the, the, the real estate security token would be in place of where you see ETH. So it would be above the, the, the USDC. Um, uh, ETH in the middle where it says ETH uh, slash USDC, or would it be under where I see the 12 in the, under the swap section? It'd be where there's the 200, right? Martin would be where you have the, um. The number of uh, security tokens um, being sold. Correct, Martin. Well, sorry, I was muted. Yes, uh, essentially here, where is the two hundred? Uh, you would have the security tokens, and let's say you would sell two hundred for twelve USDC, and it would show it first as in live order. And once it's executed, it would show it in the past orders as settled, right? And you would receive the USDC, or if you would do it, would be doing it the other way around, so you would be actually buying the tokenized shares, you would receive them in the wallet uh, okay. with which you connected, right? So then it would be also seen here that your balance is now minus 200, for example. So then one of the scenarios, Gabriel, you and I were talking about is if I wanted to tokenize a batch of mortgages, uh, I went through and tokenized it using your platform, and then I want to sell it on real estate exchange. How would I see that uh, on this menu? I, I'm a seller yeah. now of a tokenized mortgage. Yeah, so you would have uh, you would first of all, as the issuer of the of the security, you would choose yeah. uh, like a ticker or yeah. the way you want to identify the tokens um, in. Uh, it could be a fund with a bunch of mortgages, or maybe it's one yep. very big mortgage deal. Um, and so, yeah, you would, where you see ETH, they would say, uh, let's say a mortgage token, MT1, mortgage token one. Um, yep. Let's say you have uh, a thousand of those. Uh, well, you, you just put in a, a thousand um, and then you you decide the, the which, which price um, you're, you want to sell them for. Um, and then that'll post on the, on the bulletin board, um, where you see the live orders, 
Um, mm -hmm. Martin, if, am I missing missing anything? Oh uh, yeah, that's correct. And also, it would be shown in recent orders mm -hmm. for also other investors seeing uh, recent orders being uh, executed. So then, would any uh, person that's logged into real estate exchange be able to purchase uh, that MT1 token, or would they have to go through a qualification process? Be be a qualified investor to be able to purchase it, and, so and any, is there anonymity? So any any investor, um, you don't have to be a qualified uh, institutional buyer for this. Mm -hmm. um, you can be a retail um investor um because uh, you know any anything that would be offered here would be post lockup period um, okay. um and um the uh, anonymity um so well not with respect to the the platform itself and the ats and 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 us in a way because we we need to associate uh wallets to identities um However, there would be anonymity with regards to other participate participants in in the venue. Okay. Now you mentioned post lockup period, and the post lockup period that I remember hearing was one year. So if we go through a tokenization process for a mortgage, it's locked up for one year before I can offer it here. Yeah. So um, that's if you've raised. Um, you know, at, at the moment of, of tokenization, but if you're, you have an existing mortgage, um, and it's been held and the shares have been held for, um, more than a year, then you could, you could immediately enable, enable trading. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah. So I guess, uh, yeah, we can move to the more general Q and a. Part. I don't know, Martin, if you had anything else you, you wanted to, to present, but. Uh... Uh, that was all for me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So um, you said that this marketplace is in beta right now. And, and when did you expect it to be released? It'll be sometime in Q3 uh, this year. So sometime in the next three-ish months. Mm -hmm. And. and... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, James, go ahead. No, thanks, Marvin. Um, you know, as you guys move forward, what do you foresee your biggest challenges are over the next couple of years? Yeah, good question. I think, um, it, and it's not just us, I think the whole ecosystem is trying to get a network effect going. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're in, in the adoption phase, we're in the early stages. Uh, so you have the people, you know, like you guys who are passionate about blockchain, the potential, they want to do this. Um, so that's the early, early adoption. And then we want to get to mass adoption. And um, especially when we're talking about exchanges, there's a network effect that, that, that needs to happen. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard business. Um, and um, we're going to do our best, uh, first of all, with, um within the DigiShares client pool, I mean, that's where we're going to start. We're going to enable this for, for our clients. But then ultimately, we want to make it so that no, ma no matter who you've chosen as your tokenization platform, you can list on realestate.exchange. Um, and um, yeah, so definitely the, the biggest challenge. Now, uh, there are several other companies that are, are setting up I don't want to say similar exchanges, but uh, other exchanges. And uh, is there going to be any connectivity or interoperability between those exchanges? I mean, it, what I envision is there is a, a lack of interoperability between something like the New York Stock Exchange and, and NASDAQ. It, yeah. Do you see something like that happening? Yeah, excellent question. And uh, that... Um... So um, a, a few weeks ago, uh, we were uh, at Consensus, the, the conference in, in, in Austin, we we're having a discussion with two different um, ATS partners. Um, and they were both saying, you know, we got to make this happen. We have to have a way to um, have maybe a, a, a centralized 
place where investors can can see issuances on all ATSs and and enable um, you know interbroker compatibility. And I remember hearing that also two years ago. I was on a I was um, um, hearing a panel at another conference, um, and there were like four ATS heads on stage, and they were saying, "Yeah, we got to do this." Uh, hopefully in three years, it'll, it could be done. Um, I think it's probably going to take a little bit more time than mm -hmm. that. Um, but, uh, we should definitely, uh, move, uh, in that direction instead of just, uh, recreating silos, right? We're, we're trying to get rid of silos. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and you mentioned, are there other, are there other ATSs like this? Uh, yes. Um, there's T0, for example, um, which has the, the St. Regis Aspen Resort. Right. Um, uh, you know, you have uh, Oasis Pro. They don't have a real estate asset yet uh, on there, but they have, I think they have a, a wine fund and like a diamonds fund. So all sorts of assets. Um, uh, their INX is another one. So, so there, there are a few players, but we found that um, and specifically for real estate and like the small to mid-sized deals, uh, the economics don't quite work, uh, we think. Um, and, and we want to provide a, a solution for that. Uh, I would actually also like to add to this that mm -hmm. from more like a technical perspective, we are also working on standardization uh, also with competitors. Uh, mostly of what I mentioned regarding the, the the centralized identity, right? So the DIDs, we are working on a standard called DITO, so the centralized ID for tokenization. Uh, we also have a monthly call for this where anyone can join and participate. It's it's essentially an a open standard, so anyone can join. Uh, I mean, we as DigiShare started it, right? But it's not that we possess it or own it, right? But it's for everyone. So the identity is the first thing. And then we are also part of uh, multiple tokenization framework alliances, for example, ERC-1400. And we are also using ERC-1404. So basically this also will help enable adoption, right? That if also our competitors thrive and use the same standards, right? Then they can be uh, used on both platforms at the, at the end of the day, also on real estate with exchange. Uh, and, and then one last question, because I, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, James uh, asked about what size companies um, you, you guys had been working with. So uh, what size traders or investors do you envision using your platform? Because when you take a look at, or from a mortgage uh, uh, background, there are a lot of big companies that trade mortgage-backed securities, JP Morgan and, and so on. But there are a slew of smaller to mid-sized companies that are interested in using um, tokenization to be able to get liquidity. Have you guys been working at, at all with smaller banks, credit unions, or do you, have you seen any interest from them? So we don't work directly with uh, banking institutions, um, mm -hmm. but we're definitely targeting um, like the, the mid, the small mid market, not too small. It's not like anybody will be able to come and like tokenize their house and list it right. on real estate that exchange. But um, you know, uh, like a multifamily developer, maybe it's a 10 unit uh, multifamily uh, deal. Um, that's a few million dollars. Um, uh, could 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 definitely work. So yeah, same thing. And I'm I'm guessing the mortgage backed securities that are currently traded, I mean they're pooled and they're these giant pools of of assets. Um, um, and so we we would enable smaller, um, like more granularity than that. Um, uh, where if you have a deal that's maybe five million or, or um, it, it could trade. Uh, on something like real estate dot exchange, and in terms of investors, sorry, in terms of investors, real quick, um, we think that there's going to be a lot of interest uh, fr from retail investors uh, uh, because uh, it's hard for them to get into real estate deals. But also, 
uh, for the reasons mentioned with, about IFRS 13 and all that, uh, I think institutions um, will be will be interested um, so that they can allocate more uh, to these um, to these asset classes that they that they want uh, to have exposure to. Okay, great. Um, well, we're at the top of the hour. I don't know if anyone else had any questions, uh, Gabriel or Martin. Uh, before we all sign off, um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, uh, Gabriel, Martin, thank you very much for joining us. I, this was a, a fantastic presentation. I think you guys have a really interesting product. Uh, I know that when we get uh, the recordings out, there's usually quite a few downloads. So, um, did you guys uh, want to share your contact information before we sign off? Sure. Th th thank you, Mar uh, Marvin. So, um gs at digishares.io uh, my, is my email address. You can find me on, on LinkedIn, uh, Gabriel Sadoun, S-A-D-O-U-N. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we'll uh, process this recording. We'll post it on the wiki. And Gabriel, Martin, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation, as I said. And we will talk to you guys next month. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Very much, Thanks Jim. for having Great us. Great presentation. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Have a good it. one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.